Good morning once again. Thank you, worship team. Um, and it's good to be back. I, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, I, we are so blessed, my family and I, um, by this church. Um, we went up. Uh, Billy and Jean took us up there. They, were, they had vacation time and they took us up there and then helped us pack our house and our truck and sent the truck ahead and the men here at the church helped us unload all our stuff uh, into an area over here that they had uh, reserved for us. And I'm just grateful to be back home and grateful for all of y'all and um, how you've taken care of us. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back home. Um, we, uh, last week, we were talking about Palm Sunday, and, and there's been a lot going on in the, in the last week as far as Christ's time here on earth. Um, from, uh, Frank made mention to, like, what, what is it that happened f- from before when he's coming in to Jerusalem and the crowds are gathering around and, and, and Peter is saying, I'll never leave you, and, and, and all this um, passion and desire to follow Christ to he's alone on the cross and no one is speaking on his behalf. A lot of events happened in that time. A lot of things happened in that time. And uh, we're going to be visiting some of those things today. Um, our, our main uh, passage that we will be, it's, all of this is in Peter. I'm taking uh, Peter's version of these events, and, and we're kind of skimming between verse, or chapter 21 all the way through 28, but the majority of our time will be spent in uh, chapter 28. Um, but... <clears throat> He, he came in to Jerusalem last Sunday. And people received him as the coming king. Received him. It, it was a great parade. A bunch of people cheering, and, cheering him on. And what you have to understand, if you don't understand, is that the Romans had been occupying this territory. And... When we look back at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is saying there will be a deliverer, there will be a Messiah coming to de- deliver the people of Israel. And so guess what they're expecting? Politically, they're expecting a great king, a great emperor, a great leader that is going to get rid of the Romans. They're expecting a revolution. They're expecting a fight and expecting to win. They, his disciples, they've been walking with him for three years and he's been showing his power. He's been healing people. He's been multiplying food right in front of their eyes. On one occasion, they were in a storm, and he just said, be still. And the storm, the waves, everything just calmed down, settled. And so people are witnessing all of these miracles, all of these things that he's doing, And they are excited because the revolution is coming and we have Magic Man on our side. And it was a bit deflating come Friday. Friday, he's arrested without incident. Well with the exception of Peter chopping somebody's ear off. Really, there was no fight. Nothing really happened. He willingly surrendered. And on Friday, 
his followers see him get beat up and pummeled and accused and tortured and suffer. And they saw him at his weakest, couldn't even carry the cross for himself. So imagine that, right? Put yourself in their place. This great king, we have this great expectation. We're going to be delivered. Finally, we get rid of these Romans. And finally, we get rid of these religious people that lord over us. Because that's what the Pharisees did. And they have, oh, they have freedom in their mind. And come Friday, they saw, saw him fall just like any other man would. They saw him die just like any other man would. So imagine Friday. They don't understand the scriptures. They don't get it. They are well educated. Some of them have the Old Testament memorized. But they don't quite get it. So imagine Friday. This great leader that they've been expecting will deliver them on the cross. All their dreams, all their hopes as a people shattered. And so they run and they hide. Saturday depressed with no hope none none what are what are we going to do now Jesus is buried already They've got this big old rock in front of their tomb just in case, you know. The Pharisees are saying that we're going to steal the body, but we can't move that rock. All their hope. But they didn't get it. They didn't get that it wasn't just a political movement. Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen as he said, Jesus is telling them this whole time, hey, he's giving prophecies, telling them the temple's going to be leveled, they're coming after me, they're going to kill me, but I will rise on the third day. And they forgot that, that he had said, on the third day I will rise again. They forgot. Sometimes I get instructions when I go to the store for groceries. So I make up with it, you know, by bringing some cookies and stuff. But 
they forgot an essential part of what he had said. The angel is saying, do not be afraid. Of course he's going to say, do not be afraid. He's like lightning, and he just moved this big old boulder, and he is telling them, hey, hey, calm down. Don't, don't be afraid. Jesus, your leader, the one you've been following for the last three years, he's not here anymore. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. So, you've been waiting on me. Hi. He just shows up and he's like, nothing, you know, just, hey, I'm here. Like, you should be expecting me. Do we lose sight sometimes of God's word, his instructions to us? I do. There is clear truth that I should be hopeful all the time. But sometimes, you know, despair kind of kicks in. And I forget his instructions. And I go back to the scriptures. I go back to his word. And he's like, greetings. Hey, I'm still here. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. My son and I have this debate. It's not really a debate. I just, we just go back and forth. He tells me, what, what is more important, Christmas or Easter? And I'll pick one, the opposed, whatever is opposite of what he's chosen, just to get him riled up a little bit. Don't tell him. We can't have one without the other. Christmas is important. Huge. And we celebrate that. And we have a, a good two months to celebrate that. Seems like it starts in September or something. But Easter is just as important. We might get distracted sometimes because of the crucifixion. It's so horrific, right? It's so terrible. If, if we go, you know, to the movies and, and, and watch the different versions of what happened, I mean, it can really bring you down. What isn't emphasized is the resurrection. The fact that he walked on this earth and still did ministry after the resurrection. Did you guys know that? He sat, he made breakfast for his disciples. They were out fishing. And he sat over there on the Sure, saying, hey, come and eat. Made 
breakfast for them. I think fish for breakfast is a little bit weird, but, you know, to each his own. Um, And they walked around and did ministry together. And that is where our hope is, that he is risen. He's alive. Yes, he suffered. And it was terrible. And we won't make light of that. But he didn't stay on the cross. Our hope hinges on the fact that he, he didn't stay in the tomb like any other man would. He died. But he didn't stay in the tomb. And this isn't just wishful thinking. This isn't just, oh, a biased book that, of course, you know, something that the disciples made up, right, to start up this following and, and, and create Christianity. There is legitimate historical evidence that there was a Christ. And that he was crucified. You can go into secular books and find that information out for yourself. And what people can't make sense of is the, is the resurrection. They'll dismiss it. Like, oh, that's... That can't be. The report of the guards, they, they came and laid on record, hey, he is gone. What do we do with that? He is no longer there. And the religious leaders paying them off and saying, Shh, don't tell anybody that. You say, if anybody asks, the disciples came and overpowered you and took the body. The guys that are hiding for their life overpowered you. You have to have more faith than than that. It takes faith to believe that. So he says to the women, go tell my brothers to meet me in Galilee. Chapter 28. Verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority, not some authority, not divided authority, not fractured off authority, all authority is, in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. I have all authority. And I'm telling you, these are my instructions to you. All authority has been given to me. Go therefore. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I have all authority. And if you're my follower, these are Jesus' words, if you're my follower, go. Under my authority, which I have all authority, I'm telling you, go. Go and make disciples. Making a disciple is hard work. Having someone 
This may be touchy. This, this may be a touchy situation, but I'm going to tackle it anyway. Having someone say a prayer is not making them a disciple. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Taking numbers of people being saved because they came up one day and, and they said a prayer. It's not making a disciple. You have to walk with people You have to live with people and teach them as you're learning yourself, as someone is discipling you and you're discipling somebody else, what it is to be a Christian. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have a mission. When preparing for, for Easter, um, I... In the last few years, it's, it's been, it's tough. Because there's so much, so many angles that you can approach this. And, and I gather all my information during the week. And then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I'm scratching stuff out. I, you know, because we can't do it for two, two hours probably, can we? Yeah? Y'all ready? Now I won't keep you that long. Maybe just an hour. And it, it's a little, uh, on my end, it's a little bit nerve-wracking. Like, I don't get uh, too worked up when I'm going through a series because I know what I'm tackling. You know, I know what, what we're doing. Um, and I prepare beforehand. Um, I read ahead. Uh, but on Easter Sunday, there, there's, there's a little bit extra pressure. Just a tad bit. Because we want to get it right. Because God has given us this opportunity. I know that there are some new faces among us today visiting. And I'm going to tell you straight up what the Bible tells us. That believing in Christ is not enough to get you to eternity with him. Don't be confused. No. This isn't heresy that I'm giving out here. Because the Bible says, even the devil believes. He is well versed in the scripture. Abiding in Christ. That's the difference. Abiding shapes your whole life. Abiding, it motivates us for our mission. It gives us direction. Abiding in Christ. That's what makes a disciple. So my, my challenge to all of us, new and permanent members of First Baptist Church, it's not just believing. 
oh, it's a good argument. There's lots of text to support it. And, and it just feels right when I read about it and when I hear about it. So, yeah, I believe. And, I, you know, I'll, sh- I'll show up to, to, to church on occasion if I'm not fishing. If I don't need to buy some shoes. If something else doesn't come along. Abiding in Christ shapes every bit of our actions. We don't take a step without following God's wisdom. We see the Great Commission, which is what we just read, go and make disciples as our mission. We happen to have a job so we can accomplish our mission. Acts 1.8. That's more of that challenge. Go to the area around you, to the surrounding area, and all over the world. Those Those were some of his last words, so probably very important words for us. If the language in the Bible is giving us clear direction, then there can't be any argument from us. I mean, what can you say to argue against God's word? Sonia, will you come on up? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 29, in a few minutes we're going to um, partake of the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and here's the instructions. And if you are a disciple of Christ, you are welcome to participate. And you'll see, we'll read about this in just a minute. It doesn't matter if you are a member here. If you have a relationship with the Lord, an intimate relationship with the Lord, we welcome you to participate. If you don't, but you want to, man, today is the day of salvation. You know, I, I was talking about that prayer, and that's not enough. But it's a start. Going before the Lord and admitting, man, I fall short, God, I need you. That's a start. And if you, in your heart, believe that that is the only hope that you have, and you do that today, I welcome you to participate in the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night, this is Paul speaking, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You're being a witness to what Jesus did. You're remembering what Christ did for us every time that we participate in this. 
Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. What Paul is saying, don't take this lightly. This is a pretty big deal. Examine your life. Ask forgiveness where forgiveness needs to be sought. Go before the Lord in prayer. There's gonna, we're going to have some time. Sonia's going to sing in a few minutes. And then there's time to prepare. So take that time. Once again, I ask, if, if you are a disciple of Christ, please, you are welcome to participate. If you're not, this is the day of salvation. Go before the Lord earnestly and pray. Vulnerably, trans, you know, transparently, just go before him. Lord, you know, you know me. You know where I failed. 